Hey, hello Anna, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. I'm super excited to talk to you today because I think we have so many amazing things to talk about in this, you know, immigration aspect, but also li life mm -hmm. abroad and also building a career uh, as, a, as a foreigner in a new place. So Gabriela and I met uh, thanks to Lucy, uh, Lucy Jean's uh, podcast that I listened to and I kind of have been stealing a bit the people from that podcast because I'm just so excited to talk to you guys about your experiences and I think what you have built with your lives um, is extremely valuable in terms of lessons to all of us mm -hmm. who are maybe new on this journey or even have been around for a while but still there is just so much that we have to deal with. Uh, so Gabriela is a licensed psychologist with more than 20 years of experience. You have worked in HR also with that degree and now you are full-pledged uh, therapist for experts, mm -hmm. for foreigners who want to overcome their confidence challenges, who want to progress in their lives, build healthy relationships, right? So Gabriela, mm -hmm. you know how we start, right? Tell us how your first day in immigration and then maybe your first week uh, started as you moved from Chile to Austria and then from Austria mm -hmm. to Spain. Oof, it's a long time ago, already 13 years, almost 14 years that I that I am a migrant and expat. Um, my first day, it was really excited, exciting because I I uh, encounter uh, I I met or I saw again the love of my life at that time. Um, we had a long distance relationship for almost two years, and then uh, we saw each other briefly in different places. Very romantic, very you know like idyllic. Uh, and he was there at the airport and, and he picked me up and he was super nice and I was there I was there before I knew his um, family and his house so it wasn't that shocking or it wasn't new um, and still it was it's it was super romantic super nice like th that was my first day uh, my first week uh, was a little bit different like the first day was amazing la, la, la. and then the reality little by little kicked in uh, and the thing that I remember the most of that week is the bureaucracy of it. Like all the things that I had to do in order to just breathe, to stay there. Because as a third, uh, 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 not a European country, not third, but not a European country, um, it, it was difficult for me. I had a visa for three months and then I had to do something to stay. Uh, so we were thinking about possibilities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and going to that place and then that place. And no, this is uh, not. I'm not responsible for this. You have to go to that door and to that. You know, like the Asterix and Obelix thing that you have to go upstairs and then downstairs and then the middle. You know, the same thing. Uh, so that's what I remember the most of the first week. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So that was in Austria, right? Yeah, and in Vienna. That mm -hmm. was the very, very beginning of everything. Everything is fresh, everything new. It's funny because my own um, experience is kind of similar. I mean, I knew what I wanted, how, how I wanted to stay there because I moved to study. But I also mm -hmm. met my ex um, right there. Like we, we, we started mm -hmm. this long distance relationship. And then uh, after a month, we saw each other. And it's very, it was all very weird, right? It's kind of, it's, it's supposed to be your, your new life now with this, uh, in this country, with this person. And then, yeah, things went the way they went. But it's very interesting how you feel then. Uh, it's kind of your... Yeah you're scooped out of your reality and then you're placed into this new one and <laughs> mm -hmm. everything is is kind of similar but all is very different mm -hmm. uh, fascinating and then when you moved to spain right after years living there how do you think you have changed i think uh okay uh <clears throat> the first thing that was shocking for me was like from the transition from Chile to Austria, like the Latin American mentality and everything more relaxed and the punctuality and all of this more lax, more, more, more uh, uh, from the perspective, like the different points of view about it. And moving to Austria, um, everything was very, very organized and, and not, not no much room for flexibility, which is good and bad, but I really like it. 
I really enjoy that kind of organization. I'm, I'm that kind of person. Um, and then coming to um, Spain, it was a little bit like culture shock again in the sense of, okay, I'm back to Chile in a way. Because here is also, although it's Europe, it's very Latin. That's why, yeah, the, we have the Spanish uh, blood in, in our veins too. Um, so that, that was really shocking for me to realize, okay, I'm back. I have to go back to my Chilean ways to get through the bureaucracy and all of that. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, smiling more or, or like complaining a little bit more or begging a little bit more, you know, and, and also that doesn't work. It is what it is and that's it. You can smile more, you can beg more, whatever, but no, this is it and that's it. And, and in Spain is more like in Chile, so that, that, that was very good. Um, and this time we moved together with my ex-husband, uh, so we both were expats. In the first move, I was the expat and he was the local. And that's all. it was good because he helped me a lot with different things, but also it, it brought some uh, challenges to the, to the um, partnership, to, our, 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 to being a couple. And being an expat, an experienced expat as I was, I was the leading role. I was the leading person, sorry, in, the, in our move. I organized everything. I was uh, the one who calmed us down when something went wrong, when something didn't work. Uh, I was the one who, who made friends and brought, up, brought them to the couple, you know, like I, I, I took the leading role of it. And that was different from the first uh, move. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it mm. is a unique experience that is even hard to describe, right? Because uh, you were already familiar with maybe some kind of loss of identity, right? Now I need to rebuild um, this for myself in a new country, in a new environment. So I mm -hmm. kind of absorbed some part of the culture in Austria, right? Uh, how they did things, how life was over years, that's how it is. And mm -hmm. then you kind of come back to you in a way, right? Through the external environment and also mm -hmm. in collaboration and partnership with your uh, with your ex-partner uh, that mm -hmm. probably created some interesting dynamics between the two of you um, so not to go too much into details but what do mm -hmm. you think uh, you learned about being an expat couple uh, also maybe after you have been an expat kind of a solo expat right mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. What what is the difference between these things for you personally? Ooh, uh, wow, that's a very good question. Uh, it makes it easier in some aspects, and it makes makes it difficult in some aspects to being a couple or being in a relationship as an expat. And it's also different being, as I said before, being an expat, one of them an expat, and then the two of us or two of them as the couple as experts. Um, you have being a solo expat. It gives it gives you more flexibility. Flexibility. You are not so comfortable in the sense of ah, I don't need to meet so many people because I have already my partner. Even though you don't verbalize it or you don't think it like uh, rationally, it's very easy to get comfortable when you have someone already, right? It, but when you're alone or when, when you are an extrovert then you need people or an ambivert and you sometimes need people, um, it's difficult uh, to get out of your chair or the sofa and go out and meet friends. I think that would be the, the most, um, the, 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 the most um, important difference between the two of it, like being a solo expert and being an, in, in a relationship, like the drive to meet people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I understand that. And um, it also probably is a conversation that you might want to have before you even take the step. Because here we're talking about lessons learned, right? So for people mm -hmm. who want to move somewhere together as a couple, and also maybe if one of them has done this before and they have mm -hmm. their own strategy, like somehow they do that. And oftentimes it happens that people in a couple are quite different, right? In terms of their temperament, in terms of their need for social stimulation. And whereas mm -hmm. in normal context, right? Like where we, wherever we live or when we have your, you know, our normal life, this somehow mm -hmm. gets, um, I don't know, it has a different flavor because maybe we have a family, maybe we have our friends from even childhood, like it's whole life that we have built. And then mm -hmm. when we need to do it from scratch, it can 
creates a lot of challenges uh, like for us personally but also take it in a couple who already yeah. might have their own you know like every couple has their own exactly points of conflict or mm -hmm. you know tension um, mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad that you said that mm -hmm. all right so coming back to to you right your professional life as well you are a licensed therapist and you said it psychology in Chile right but mm -hmm. then how did you how did you get into HR and why and then how did you come back to what you're doing uh, well I started I studied psychology because I wanted to be a therapist that was always my goal but in Chile at that time and I think now is worse than before it was difficult to start a, as a clinician because you needed needed experience right and when you are fresh out of the university and for us it was it was easier for, in, in comparison to other countries because we were already trained as clinicians when we were graduating as psychologists we were also clinicians clinical psychologists we didn't need to do another master's degree or something we were already trained with a lot of uh, uh, training hours but still the people were asking for experience 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 so i was 21 fresh out of university and I, I wanted to work so the possibilities uh, opened up in the in the human um, resources path and I made my career in human resources in, in recruitment and selection uh, department and, and it was the most the closer aspect of human resources for me related to psychology and in that time that time I remember that's oh my God, 20 years ago. <laughs> so it's, it's a uh, 20, yeah, 22 years ago. So it's, um, it was like all the cultural things like climate in the organization that was re starting developing, at least in Chile, maybe in other countries, it was more developed. So yeah, that was my, my, my loophole to do some clinical work in the human resources. So I, I made my career there and I, and I started there. Uh, um, I started to, to climb the ladder and, and, and yeah, I got comfortable there. So I stayed there the whole time until I moved away from Chile in the same company, in the same department. But I started as a junior psychologist and I ended up as a manager of, of the national department of Sci um, recruitment and selection. And, uh, okay, sorry. Ask. No, 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 continue, <laughs> please. Uh, and then I moved away and I moved to Vienna. And human resources was the easiest way, let's say, because it's not difficult when, when I ha you have the experience that I had to find a job. I needed to speak, to, uh, to learn German first, so it, it took me a while. But then I realized, mm -mm, this is the time if I studied, I studied psychology is because I wanted to be a therapist. So uh, this is my time to uh, fulfill that dream. And I started to um, pave my pavement, my path to uh, becoming, to, to again uh, uh, be a clinician. And I um, certified, certified myself as a coach in in german it was a challenge and i started working in an ngo for migrants uh, as a as a not as a therapist but as a um, like a counselor like that's what i do now like a counselor for migrants for women um and that was like it was the perfect match for me like being a therapist again and also or a counselor again and being and working with migrants and expats because I was working with the, the the whole palette of people like from migrants like refugees to diplomats wives so it was like the very the very colorful it, it, it was really amazing I learned so 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 much what I learned the most is we have different problems of course and different struggles but the way that we cope with them and the emotions that are triggered by it by them are very very similar so I, I very very similar more than you can imagine so yeah that that was the beginning of my journey as I as a counselor and then when I moved to to Spain I decided to start it, start my own business and do it online because because I work with expats so that means I can reach more people around the world and that makes my my job amazing in that sense 
It does. Um, that's a mm-hmm. fascinating journey and uh, really, really inspiring as well. So you found a way to, as you said, like pave your own path with what you mm-hmm. had, where you, where, where you were, right? Like there were the opportunities you couldn't get at that point, but you found a way. And I think that's super important to consider when we even talk about career, because very often to us uh, as migrants, it happens that our qualifications are maybe not enough or they're not uh, recognized or something, uh, you know, like that, that really challenges us to, I don't know, start a new job or, you know, go Mm -hmm. to to companies or places where we feel that we're kind of stepping back. And that can also influence a lot how we feel and our worthiness, our confidence. Um, But I'm very curious about what you said about the emotions that we all feel that are similar. So what are those? Can you tell us a bit more? Um, what you are uh, think we're feeling yeah uh, let me add something before we can of course talk about that but let me say that before I did all this beautiful story that I told you I worked I started working from scratch in Austria I worked with um, how do you say that in English with pension pensionist like people in pension uh, serving coffee right uh serving coffee and actually it was fun because we were playing cards i served coffee and then we we had to entertain them so i played cards and 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 and, and other games and and i i i i was able to to speak german and practice my german but still i was a very very successful manager in chile and i made my decision and i'm i'm so happy that i did but from that kind of confidence and kind of status and and kind of a, a, a economical level to that, it was a really interesting uh, pride exercise, let's say, and, 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 and reality check as well. So, yeah, I, I, I know and, and, and I lived that struggle too. I have this career, but when I move, I have to start from, I have to, maybe I need to start from scratch so that I can learn the language, etc., etc. So that's, that's also important to, to uh, remember to your audience that it's, that's something super common in, in the expat path. Yeah. Okay. So emotions coming back. Yes. Um, <laughs> what are those? I would say like the most common one among all of us who move abroad for whatever reason is guilt. Guilt of uh, pff, name it. Guilt because I left my parents behind. Be guilt because I'm not living up to the expectations of myself or to others. Guilt because I'm not seizing the opportunity that I'm being presented by being here, especially in, in those th- first world countries like Austria. Uh, guilt because I'm not seeing my my kids or my nephew or my ne- niece or my I don't know my cousin growing grow up. And I'm missing things if, um, um, within my family, like important events, etc. Uh, guilt because it was the wrong decision, or I think it was the wrong decision. I don't know. Name it. The, 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 again, the whole palette of guilt. That I, I would say that's the most the most common one, the most common emotion. Then you have uh, MB, triggered by comparison, and people really struggle with envy because envy has a really bad reputation as an emotion right you're a bad person if you feel envious right but the more you accept that is all of us all of us 100 percent have felt and feel envy and it's part of the emotions that we usually feel that's normalize it 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 helped a lot the people it's the thing that you do with envy or you act or you, how you behave that's the difference and that's the good or the bad right but feeling envy is completely normal so envy is like i compare it to one expat or to one migrant that it's very successful that uh, speaks the language that have friends that uh, i don't know whatever and me i don't have friends or i'm not successful i i i feel envy and i compare myself to that and the third one, you would say, I would say loneliness. That's also very common. You can be lowly in, in your gold cage or you can be lowly in, in a very precarious situation. But it, it, that's, that is very, very transversal. It, it, it goes through the whole 
levels of uh, economic acquisition or your social status or the way you migrate. It, th those are the, th the three more common emotions that I saw in my, that I'm seeing, that I still see in my practice and, and that I saw in, in Austria, working with those different yeah. uh, women. Mm -hmm. I totally mm -hmm. resonate. These are my own three main feelings, even now, after 10 years I've been living abroad. And I will add mm -hmm. that for me, the guilt comes also from uh, my now ability to have more money, right? It's also one thing that we, uh, I mean, that's, that's probably for many people is a reason why we even migrate. Like we want to have a better life, like so-called better life, like whatever that is for many people, for me and for my family, migration was for, for me, how they saw it was to go somewhere where I could have better opportunities, which of course mm -hmm. means that eventually you'll be compensated better. And now I find myself mm -hmm. in a situation where I am guilty to spend my own money, hard earned money on myself because uh, in my family culture, kind of suffering and struggling is what we all have grew up, grown up with. And now I, am, I don't know how to get, you know, how to go past by that. With my therapist, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about that. And she is saying, yeah, we, we need to talk on this, on this specific thing, because even if you, let's say, even if you help your family, even if you, you know, mm -hmm. give them certain amount of money, if you want, it's not going to cure that guilt. It's not that. It was very interesting that, exactly. revelation mm -hmm. for me, right? Because we mm -hmm. often, you know, I, I was kind of the good girl of the family. I was the, the A student and I was, you know, my family was very proud of me. Oftentimes they were putting me as an example towards my little brother, which created some dynamic between us. Um, but what, I, what I'm saying is that I have this innate feeling that I need to prove that I'm still good, that I'm good enough, that I will, you know, keep, keep, keep being good. And mm -hmm. now this is my career, this is the money I make. And if I don't feel like I'm, you know, seizing opportunities or move fast enough or make like all this money in the world, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, the sacrifice was supposed to be for something. So that's one thing yeah. I want to add, like um, this, this challenge. And then when you said about envy, I think especially at the beginning and especially if you have to step down, you know, in terms of your career or term, or your um, conditions, right? Like the, 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 the lifestyle, the, uh, the opportunities, then there is envy also towards what you have left behind because they keep going they keep having their lives they i know my friends as uh, i moved abroad as i was 20 just 21 so just out of the university and many of my you know young adult friends they started building their careers they had more opportunities mm -hmm. than me at that point uh mm -hmm. some of them you know inherited houses or cars or things like that and i was there thinking about oh my god my scholarship of 2000 euros a year is the most money i've ever you know had which was now it's very funny because this is of course like more than my salary a month <laughs> mm. but um that envy as well like towards what you have left behind where people kind of keep going and you have to start from scratch like minus five you know steps like in the in the games when you play mm -hmm. when you kind of roll the dice and now you're back back uh, at the not even beginning maybe how you feel mm -hmm. it that's so mm -hmm. interesting and of course loneliness is a big chunk of that because yeah, that brings us to uh, to just feeling like, am I worthy enough of anything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I want to mention something about what you said about uh, the envy that uh, uh, directed to what we left behind. That's super, super true. Absolutely, I agree completely with what you, with what you said. And but for that, and not but and for that, it's also very, very important to have always in your head and maybe in post-its all around your house or your bedroom or whatever why did you move why did you make the decision your why because it's so difficult and everyone listening please it's so difficult our decision even if it was completely willingly and it was completely up to us and la 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 you know all my responsibility still it's so difficult what we have to deal with so always remember or go back to 
Why did you move? Why, why, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself in this situation? Because yes, it's lovely to be a, an expat in so many ways, but it's also very challenging. And nobody talk, or not more and more, thank God, but uh, not enough is talked about it. So we talk about the good and the, the beautiful things of it, but as, as we talk about envy, guilt, loneliness, and so much more are just around the corner. So the, the most important thing about uh, to cope with it or to start coping with it is to remember why you moved. So you can just um, repeat the same thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So remember why you moved. Remember your purpose of moving because it's going to be challenging. We are going to have all the things that we already named and more like loneliness, envy, guilt, and, and I don't know, uh, shame and, and uh, feeling like a toddler and the, the culture shock, etc., etc., etc. So the purpose, your purpose, your why. Put it big or small with a lot of post-its where you can see it and don't don't forget about it. Thank you. That's that's beautiful, super, super necessary as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that. I was always <laughs> doubting myself in my head, but do I need to come back? And I didn't want to come back. At any mm -hmm. point I didn't want however challenging it was, I didn't want to come back. So maybe yeah, if you have that kind of resolution, maybe that helps. But putting it mm -hmm. visual somewhere is also a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right, so coming back to the workspace, right, as we need to start from scratch, as we are going through a lot of challenges, of course, it takes a lot of our work to, you know, to just raise the hand and be there and be there for ourselves so that mm -hmm. we can feel uh, like we belong in a place, but also the workspace and where we are as we mm -hmm. work. Uh, mm -hmm is very important to us as professionals so that we feel that we belong, right? Like now we mm -hmm. talk a lot about culture, diversity, inclusion. It wasn't like that back maybe when you started in HR as well. Mm -hmm. no. um, so with everything that you have learned in your experience in HR, you mm -hmm. being a therapist, you being a counselor, mm -hmm. and also I know that you collaborate now with companies mm -hmm. uh, in, on that specific topic. Can you tell us how companies can be better employers as well to us as such diverse workforce mm -hmm. uh, being aware of the differences and not uh, trying to put us all and uh, if they have they work with internationals to put all the internationals in one just one box as workers 
because we are we speak different languages, we come from different backgrounds, we um, our culture is different, our approach to work is different. It doesn't mean that it's better or worse. And we can th there are things that we can adapt, uh, like in the workplace, but there are things that we can en enrich our companies from the perspective of expats and migrants too. It's not like the way we do it is the best way, but listen to your workers and listen what they have to say about how to improve processes or how to improve communication and integration. Um, f uh, um, how do you say that? Um, foster an environment of communication, of acceptance, of uh, curiosity. That's super important. Curiosity to... Uh, to foster the fact that people ask questions, to foster the fact that people are in need to share the culture where they come from and listen, listen to their needs, listen to their, in my case, mental health needs. I'm, I'm glad that companies are reaching out uh, to me and because they focus on the needs of their expats, employees, employees. Um, the challenges that we talked about, all of that, if they are suffering that, if they're struggling with this, they are um, uh, slowing down, let's say, or, or, or they are not fulfilling the, ex the expectations that you have as a company when you hire them, right? So it's like, like from the economical point of view only, that's the most cold one and rational one, it's important that you put effort and you put you invest resources in your human resources so that they are happy and productive. That's from the economical point of view. And from the moral and the cultural point of view, it's important that you have happy employees. In order to have happy expat employees, it's important to listen to them, to open the communication channels and to be curious about what they have to say in the company and for the company. Mm -hmm. I see. Those are really beautiful things that you said. Um, have you as as you were working in hr have mm -hmm. you had your you know people in the t in the team that were uh, foreigners no, no. I, I didn't but mm -hmm. i was a foreigner in a company mm -hmm. before i moved uh, uh, to to solopreneur and uh, i was the only migrant in that company at the beginning and then they, they hired two more um and i think in intuitively intuitively <laughs> with intuition um my boss and and, and 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 the people in the leadership they were fostering that without even knowing because they were fostering diver diversity in other aspects uh, of uh, of um uh of the palette but not in the in the immigration part or, or the expat part but when i arrived they were completely they were exactly what i said before they were curious they were asking me questions they, they, they were asking me if i understood what they meant when they did something and, and i and i didn't fit in that they asked um they were concerned about the language and they were concerned about speaking very clearly so that i can understand and not speaking in dialect for example that's very common in companies when you don't have many internationals in in, in working with you um, those kinds of things. So that I think that I learned a lot from being an employee to what I want to offer to the companies that I work with and also to, to, um, to me as an employee, what I need and what I have to demand from my employees, but from my employers, sorry. I don't know if that made sense. It was a lot it of does. employee employers. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It does, it does. Thank you, mm -hmm. Gabriela. All right, so where can people and companies learn more about you and what mm -hmm. you have to offer mm -hmm. uh, people either to one-on-one -on -one counseling or to book me for workshops and talks for companies they can reach me in www.gabriela-encina.com or just google gabriela encina psychologist and you will find me as the first <laughs> um you can book me uh for, for next year to work with companies to 2024 and yeah the only the only um important thing that you have to bear in mind is that you have to be an expert or work with experts and that's it mm -hmm. 
Wow, mm -hmm. that's that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Gabriela. I want to recap some of the lessons that we heard today so then we mm -hmm. can leave the audience with some really spe specific and practical things that they can follow. So mm -hmm. before when we talked about being in partnership with your co uh, partner uh, that also is an expert maybe you the both of you have had this experience already and that can be easier but nevertheless have a talk before you move about your diverse needs your different th things that you need in order to feel at home and how you can collaborate on that as well because very likely this will be a whole new experience for you and even if maybe both of you are seasoned experts it doesn't mean that the new reality, new country is something you're familiar with. So then their ways of doing things can be yeah, <laughs> can be challenging for one of you or both of you. And how do, will you deal with that? That's where teamwork and partnership comes in. Mm -hmm. um, then we talked a lot about remembering your why and sticking to it in the hardest moments because they will happen for sure <laughs> and we will need to try to understand how to maintain, you know, that North Star because emotions will come and they'll be really challenging, very difficult, not anything we have really experienced to this level uh, before. And then if companies want to be more inclusive and more attentive about us as their um, members, as their employees, as their collaborators, they probably need to be curious, they need mm -hmm. to be respectful, they need to maybe think about what it is that we might not know that is very crucial because if we don't know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they can have this overview, they can help us. Right, would you add anything to this, Gabriela? It was a beautiful recap. I just want to add to the second part of uh, um, uh, the emotions and, and the things that we have to deal with and remember in your why. And in general, talk about it talk and search and look for help there are many many resources not only uh, mental health uh, professionals like me but also blogs and also uh, people that have i don't know more experience than you moving abroad talk about it it's completely valid and completely normal whatever you're feeling don't hide don't repress don't shame yourself for feeling the way you feel it is completely normal and it's fine and it's valid ask for help I would underline and stress and, 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 and exclamation point that <laughs> sentence, ask for help if you need it. Yes, that's, that should be a poster somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriela, for your time. A You're brilliant, fascinating conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your work and to have maybe another chat with you as well mm -hmm. one time. Yes. Have a great day and- um, You too. Thank you lot. for the lovely conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs>